Can we start? Sure. Whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Um, so I guess this is the anatomy of an interactive. Uh, we're all from Acoustiguide and Acoustiguide Interactive. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the creative process going on with uh, an interactive experience and also a little bit about beacon technology. Um, but the first thing I want to say is um, this is a panel discussion, but we, we think we know what you want to hear and, and talk about, but we really want to uh, um, have you guys interact with us. Um, and, and at any time that we're talking, you want to interrupt, please do, because we much rather you derail our entire presentation and get the information you want uh, and have us talk about what you want than to just drone on about something you don't care about. Uh, so, now for <laughs> like now, for instance, yeah. So here, uh, this is Simon Dale. He's our chief architect. Um, that's Jeff. He's our uh, graphic designer, chief graphic designer. And then John is our creative director. I think that's what his title is: senior producer, digital media strategist, <laughs> creative director. Just, like, mash that all together for one time. And he's also our writer. And, and uh, in the second part of the program that you saw on the previous slide, uh, we're talking about the Hunger Games. John wrote the entire narrative to that. Um, and I'm on there as well, but that's not so important. Um, we've been doing this a while. Um, we have, I guess, 30 million users in 2014, um, working over various projects. Uh, so this is, comes from some experience um, through various clients that you can see up here uh, and many, many others. So uh, if there's any questions about specific projects, we'll be happy to address those as well. Um, and then again, please interrupt jump in anytime. We don't need to worry about any kind of uh, waiting to the end, although we'll try to leave some time. Just please interrupt. Uh, we, can, we can go ahead. Yeah. So what are beacons, I guess, is the first question. And I'm going to let the panel address this. Um, so maybe, yeah. maybe Simon would like to take it away here. Yeah, sure, and I'll, I'll keep it relatively quick. There have been a number of sessions that have gone into this in detail. Um, more or less, uh, beacons are a tool that, uh, or, or little, the, these little Bluetooth objects, that broadcast out a signal. Um, that is more or less what it is. When we're talking about iBeacon, we're just talking about a way that the signal is formatted. When we're talking about Eddystone, it's the same kind of thing. It's just broadcasting a signal out that a device can receive. Does so anyone else want to add to that? It was fairly succinct. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, guess the, I guess the antithesis of that would be it doesn't receive information, uh, I, I think is what we're, Simon is really going for here. Um, so then how accurate are these beacons and what, what, uh, what, are they, what can they do? What are their capabilities? <clears throat> sure. Yeah. I'll jump in. Uh, how accurate are they? Well, they're affected by the environment. They're affected by glass, concrete, people, water. Um, they're affected by all sorts of things. Um, how accurate are they? Depends on their placement. Ideally, you're looking for line of sight. Uh, you know, if the beacon can't actually see the device line of sight, chances are there's something that will impede the signal. That can affect accuracy. And then, of course, the further away you get from it, that can affect accuracy. Uh, these things are just trying to distribute a signal over a certain distance, and we try and guess accuracy based on the signal strength. Uh, and environmental factors can play in, which can reduce accuracy. Closer you are to the beacon, uh, stronger the signal can be detected, the more accurate the results can be. The further you get away, uh, it can kind of muddy the accuracy. Yeah, so whenever you're working on a project that has uh, beacon integration, uh, you have to take into account the fact that the accuracy is not always great. Uh, it's hard to get uh, very specific granularity. Uh, so when you're thinking about the user experience, you have to design with that in mind. Um, if you're trying to design an experience where uh, timing is, is very key, or uh, if you need to be uh, extremely close to something uh, to make your experience work, uh, beacons are going to be uh, problematic for that type of project. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if you guys are interested in the question, basically what are our options then in terms of like if people talk about blue dot, they talk about when you talk about proximity, we have different ways of working different things having to do with beacons in terms of triggering or in terms of wayfinding or whatever. What are the different sort of options that the beacons give us? Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, there are plenty of options. Um, beacons by themselves, they're just broadcasting a signal. So from that, you can determine some kind of proximity. And uh, one term that I'm sure we'll use you know, throughout this presentation is, oh yeah, sorry. 
one term we'll use throughout the presentation is content servicing. You know, rather than focus on blue dot wayfinding and so on, uh, beacons can be a way to surface content. You know, as a user walks through a museum, their device detects a beacon. That's where an application can show them content. But you can do more um, with more complicated beacon installations. You know, the more you put in, the more we can start looking at things like blue dot. Uh, triangulating the user's position and trying to get a uh, granular position to show them on the map as they're moving through, much like uh, a GPS signal. Well, one question I always get is about um, the radius of these things. And it, you, you'll see it says like, oh, it can go within six inches, it can do five feet, it can do 20 feet. Is that a, a real estimate? Is, is that how, how much can we depend upon those uh, kind of uh, stats that are advertised? Yeah, um, they're really not going to do below a meter uh, very well. Um, I've seen beacons that advertise they can do up to about 275 feet, um, which I have seen. And again, environment can play into it. Uh, you know, one thing that be beacon vendors will do is try and um, simplify what they're putting out there. So they might say, you know, this beacon can do 15 feet, 100 feet. But that's not actually what the beacon is, is configured to do. The beacon is configured to send out a signal with a certain amount of power and that amount of power will somewhat correlate with the distance it will travel. Environmental factors can play in there. Um, we did have one installation where a beacon was installed at the Guggenheim, um, and we're, we'll talk about the Guggenheim in a little bit. Uh, top floor of the rotunda, and it was configured to do about 10 to 15 feet um, distance. We could see it over 100 feet away. <laughs> uh, just this one beacon, and we figured just given the placement, it was bouncing off the glass at the top of the rotunda. Uh, because if you were 100 feet away, exactly across from it, on the opposite end of the rotunda, you could see it. Um, so I guess in terms of your question, one meter is probably the smallest. You can see up to probably 200, 275 feet. Uh, in practice, with the user experiences we offer, we generally uh, don't suggest more than about a 20 right. foot, um, 20 foot configuration. So to use the example that you just stated, um, you know, if, you, if the user experience you were designing, um, if it would completely break if you uh, if content was triggered a uh, hundred feet away from the from the object, um, you know that's that's something that can happen you know, depending on, on beacon placement. So you'd want to make sure that uh, you design that into the experience from the beginning. Once you set a beacon, is it consistently broadcasting the same distance all the time, or does that change? Does it, do environmental factors constantly change it, or is it kind of somewhat uniform? Uh, it's somewhat uniform. I mean, they're they're configured to broadcast at certain intervals at a certain power, and they will continue to try and do that over time. Um, in theory, the environment should be relatively static. You know, if you put the beacon in a metal cage, that will interfere with the signal all the time. So you should expect a relatively low signal all the time. Um, where we see variation most often is with visitor traffic, uh, and and in doing tuning and installations. You know, uh, you'll walk around, the museum's closed, you tune the beacons, you think you have it right, the museum opens, there are a couple people standing in front of a work, and suddenly the beacon's not triggering as well. Sure. And, and that is, uh, again, down the line of sight, signal can't go through people. Yeah. Um, do you find that there's a lot of difference in um, the signal strength depending on device? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Android is relatively fragmented, um, and, and you know, it's just all over the board. IOS we found more consistent for the most part, with the exception of one device, uh, which is the iPhone 5S. It underperforms substantially. Um, uh, there were uh, there was one application. I, I just had an iPhone 5S, which is why I know I spent a lot of time on this. Um, <laughs> where an iPod 5, an iPhone 6, and a, an iPod 6 might detect a beacon signal within about a second of walking into range, it could take up to nine seconds on the 5S. Yeah, uh, yeah very very underpowered. Apple's never officially acknowledged it. Um, we've talked to a couple of vendors, they've, they've observed the same thing. So yeah, there definitely is variance that plays into it. What about battery life? How often do you have to replace batteries? Depends on a number of factors, how often they broadcast, uh, what the broadcasting power is. Um, vendors are usually, oh, and then of course, how big the battery is. Um, vendors are normally pushing or advertising between about two to four years. Um, of course, it is a relatively new type of technology, so I don't know that anyone's actually tested it. Um, right. there have how far we are down the line of people being able to actually measure how long it takes. Is it two to five years? Is it still kind of... Well, and, and when they say two to five years, that would be um, under ideal conditions. So, you know, broadcasting uh, every, every few seconds, and that interval is, is long, and broadcasting at a relatively low power, um, then you might get to two to four years. Can you we've seen 
um, even at low power devices, um, you know, beacons burn out after a month or two. What do you mean by broadcasting every few seconds? Well, beacons, uh, essentially they're just little uh, radio broadcasters. Uh, they uh, are every few seconds, or whatever you determine an interval, they just basically broadcast, I'm here, and this is my ID number. Yeah, think of it like a pulse. So you adjust the pulse, how quick it, yeah. Uh, but to answer that question, though, it really depends on the type of beacon that you've installed. You know, some of them come with low quality cells, and they run out a lot quicker than those that come with AA batteries, and they uh, run out a lot quicker than those that are actually hardwired and low power to. Yep, and then chipset as well. Um, there, are, there are different manufacturers that use different chipsets. Some are more optimized, so they draw less power. Um, there are, and I don't, I don't have the link off the top of my head, but there are some independent uh, contractors out there that have tried to gauge battery life across 30 plus vendors um, by actually over a period of a month calculating the power draw every hour for that particular beacon and then based on the size of the battery try and estimate then uh, how long they'll last. Um, the longest ones based on estimations are somewhere between 24 to 36 months usually. You had a question, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I don't know if this might be getting a little too much into the weeds, but um, given the, um, the broadcast intervals, uh, how do you deal with uh, incorrect signals? Like you might have two beacons that are just yeah. overlapping in, in field and you're getting uh, you know, the wrong uh, beacon and you're sort of flip-flopping signals in between. It's a great question. Um, there, I don't even know if I have a great answer. We I, I think that it really like, comes down to, the again, the type of experience that you're, you're trying to build. Um, you know, if you're uh, planning to put beacons um, in a relatively small area, um, you, you can probably assume that the, the signals are going to uh, intermix in, 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 depending on the, which part of the room you're in. So if you were trying to build an experience where you wanted one thing and one thing only to trigger as you got close to a particular beacon, that would be a problem because you would see two signals simultaneously and, yeah. and the device will register and seeing one, two, three, or, or multiple beacons um, at, at once. Um, so as, as we move through the, the presentation, we'll show a few examples of, of what we built. One of the, the concepts that we've sort of centered around on how to deal with is this idea that we sort of call the, the near me mode, that as you move through um, a, a gallery or a space, um, content is presented that happens to be nearby you, and we show you um, as many uh, content items as are attached to beacons that are near you. Yeah, and, and we will cover a couple of examples. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's never been a one-size-fits-all. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll definitely go over some case studies, and, and I'll address the question then. Uh, so there are a lot of these things popping up. I know we've done about five installations or so in the last year and a half or so. Why are they so popular? What What is the advantage of doing these things? Uh, I think uh, clearly one reason that uh, a lot of institutions are, are interested in, in beacons is because they're sort of, they're buzzworthy at the moment. You know, you come to MCN or museums on the web and there's multiple panels talking about them. And um, I think they, there's the, at least a, a few years ago when they, when they were really new, um, there was this idea that they could become sort of the, the holy grail for, for indoor positioning. And, and by using beacons, there, there you know, was an idea that we could finally uh, be able to present uh, content in a very timely way to users uh, without them having to, on a mobile device, for instance, tap around on a bunch of screens, without maybe having to use a keypad or a search feature or uh, QR codes that nobody likes. Um, so I think. You know, there's this idea that they could finally solve a bunch of wayfinding and content surfacing problems, um, and, and, and they're just sort of the, the new thing, so people are really interested in them, uh, sort of irregardless of how useful they actually are. They're, you know, they're, they're an interesting technology, so I think a lot of people are saying, hey, what's up with vegans? So yeah, I guess on the same topic then, uh, you mentioned near me a little bit. Yeah, you can, you can switch. <laughs> Uh, so aside from near me technologies and, and telling you those kinds of things, what, what other benefits can you draw from beacons? What are their, what are their, what are feature sets can they enable us to do? Yeah, uh, so we've talked a lot about near me, which um, we also try and position as content surfacing, you know, showing what's relevant around you. Um, there can definitely be location triggered actions, you know, notifications as people enter rooms, exit rooms, etc. Uh, and this can also be very targeted. Um, you know, you walk near the gift shop, notifications uh, can show up. And of course, to the next point, location-based notifications. Sales in the shop, a tour is about to start. Uh, you know, if there is a docent nearby, that can help. Um, there can be blue dot, so uh, the, this actual you know, 
uh, concept of following someone as they're moving through the museum. And you can get analytics, and uh, this can actually give you more information on how people are moving through the space. You know, what is the dwell time in front of very specific uh, exhibitions? What does the heat map look like? Where are the most uh, popular paths throughout the museum? So is, is it the beacon themselves that are telling you this information, or is there some sort of relation with the software? Uh, it, it'll be the software. Um, and, and we'll I think get to this in, in a couple of slides as well. Um, but it's, it's mostly the software and crowdsourcing the data that you have. So you know you have this pool of devices that are detecting beacons and then using this, that will go up to some platform, a content management system, Google Analytics, could be the beacon vendor system. Uh, and at that point, all the data can be uh, crunched, put into reports and try and answer the questions that are being asked. Sure. Um, okay, great. Um, so I get a lot of phone calls, and sometimes people ask me, well, why don't we just use beacons for this, or why can't we just use beacons for that? And sometimes I struggle with having to explain how, what, what the limitations of the beacons are, what can't they do, um, where, where, does they, where do they drop off and function? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Thank you. Beacons, beacons, they're just a tool. Um, by themselves, they can't really do much. You know, we're talking about um, Blue Dot now and again, and to get Blue Dot to work, there is a lot of tuning, there's a lot of software, uh, a lot of algorithms that kind of go into positioning. Uh, can, you, can you tell us what Blue Dot is? Yeah, Blue Dot, the, uh, well, thinking GPS, it, it would be a Blue Dot that represents your position on the map. As you move, it moves. Um, and so they are just a tool. They broadcast a small amount of data, and all of the magic really lies in the tools that you build around it and the software uh, that you build around these tools. Beacons themselves don't actually do almost anything. They just essentially just broadcast that they're there, and they broadcast their unique identifier. No questions. Okay, great. Um, so if uh, most museums, most institutions, most places have Wi-Fi, um, they have other technologies. Uh, does that interfere with our beacons? Can we still use them? This is yeah, no, uh, you can definitely use uh, beacons in conjunction with other location uh, technologies. Uh, a lot of uh, museums, uh, in particular larger organizations, will have uh, Wi-Fi based real-time location systems from maybe Cisco or from uh, Aruba is another vendor. Uh, you can, uh, those are, uh, they tend to be quite costly uh, and they're not, uh, not super accurate. Uh, you know, most installations I've seen about, if you can get to uh, a Wi-Fi based RTLS system to say that you're um, in a particular room and that that's accurate, then, then you're doing pretty well. Um, so you can combine um, other types of indoor positioning like RTLS, uh, outdoor positioning like GPS with beacons and each uh, technology serves its own role and, and serves, uh, can be utilized in different ways to provide a, a different experience. Um, uh, taking that even a little bit step further, I know that there are software vendors out there that are starting to do uh, what's called uh, RF fingerprinting. So they take a, a device, move through the space, and they're basically just measuring the radio signals that the device can measure as you go through the space. And uh, I think uh, Navazon and Wayfarer are two uh, vendors that offer a solution that they're, they're tracking as they move through and they're cataloging the Wi-Fi RF signals that are uh, sort of ambiently being uh, projected in the space as well as, uh, as well as beacons now. Yeah. When you guys build your apps, um, is the eye beacon usually the kind of main feature of the app or is it kind of an additional and you offer other information um, just including it? Because the trouble we had was um, there was a massive barrier of entry um, for people downloading the actual app just to have this eye beacon functionality. Yeah, absolutely, because um, if you're bringing your own device to the space um, to make uh, IB Kin technology work, the device has to have Bluetooth turned on, so you can't be on uh, airplane mode, which if you're an out-of-town visitor, you might have turned off uh, all data and, and put your, plane in, or your phone into airplane mode to save on, on data. Um, and, and over and above that, yeah, there, there definitely can be um, a, a lack of understanding about what these features are. Um, on iOS, you have to actually explicitly ask the user permission to use uh, location services uh, to be able to use iBeacon. So if you haven't properly explained why you want to use these uh, services, uh, they might deny. So you kind of, you have to uh, build in backups and, and redundancies, uh, other ways to be able to access the, the information, whether that's uh, you know a keypad, or, or search, or a scrollable list of, of content, or some other visual method for, for browsing. Question. Is it realistic to use them for a contemporary exhibition, like very thin walls and short time to set up everything? 
rest of them. Does this make sense? Works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we're going to talk about the Hunger Games at the end of this. This is a traveling exhibition, and uh, in fact, I mean, we've had the luxury on the software side of having a couple of months, but for the actual beacon installation, that was just a couple of days, um, because the exhibition was being constructed uh, just days before opening. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, I mean, they're, easy, they're relatively easy to place, they're discreet, they can move, um, and so that makes them easy for temporary exhibitions. As for thin walls, uh, and such, that is probably a more complex issue that goes to the user experience uh, and what you're trying to offer. Trying to know which side of the wall you're on. Yeah, which side of the wall you're on. There can be bleed, um, and there can be a lot of tuning there uh, to try and make it work well. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely talk a little bit more about the, inst the Hunger Games installation since I was the one who, who got to put them in, but it's a definitely a, a good question and, and something I'll, I'll go more into. We had a lot of trouble with thin walls. With yeah, it's, that's definitely... could take a lot of experimentation with beacon placement and tuning. Uh, right, so that really is a good segue, thank you, <laughs> into this next slide. The, the question is, um, beacons are widely available. They're somewhat, they're fairly inexpensive, and they come with uh, open source software. Why can't uh, an institution just use these on their own why should they consider using an outside vendor to help them with this process? Ben? Sure. Yeah, uh, so I mean, in terms of the open protocols and just getting basic functionality working, it can be done yourself. It, it's not uh, that hard. I mean, on iOS uh, and Android, it's pretty easy to get something up and running. Um, where vendors help, and I do mean vendor in the agnostic sense, we're talking beyond Acoustica. This could be Estimo, Wi-Fi, Novizen. Um, there's a lot of value add just beyond the hardware themselves. I mean, beacons, we think of them as a commodity. Anyone can make them, many vendors do. They're, they're relatively low cost. The value add is in uh, additional things. Um, Blue Dot, for example, you know, that's not something right out of the box. There are some companies that offer software to do that. Fleet management, you know, if you have a very large space and you need a thousand beacons, um, you know, going to questions about battery life, how are you going to manage that? And you know, fleet management and some kind of cloud platform that can give you notifications and tell you the health of your beacons. You know, there, there's a lot of value there, and there are a lot of vendors in the space that uh, that do offer this and uh, offer a lot of value just beyond the hardware themselves. Great. So maybe some case studies on on some of these. Um, I know you want to talk about the science museum. I have nothing to do with that. Um, CMHR, uh, all these all these places. Please uh, take it away. Whoever's going first on those. Sure. Uh, so we wanted, to, as Michael said, we wanted to give a few examples of some projects that we've worked on over the last, um, really actually all, all three of which I think over the last year uh, that make use of, of beacons. And the first one I wanted to, to highlight was the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Um, so uh, they opened uh, officially just last year. Um, it's the first new uh, federal museum in Canada that has been built in, in quite a long time. And it's, it's a very, very impressive museum. It's in a way, it's almost more like a, a science museum than, than a traditional museum with a lot of digital content, a lot of interactive content. And one of the, the things that we identified very early on was that um, a traditional uh, audio tour or multimedia tour um, app or experience wasn't going to be something that was necessary for this type of museum. Uh, but what they did need is, um, a, uh, you know, it's, it's a very large space, it's a very interesting architecture. Um, and you know, being a, a museum for human rights, uh, accessibility and universal design are, are key considerations for, for CMHR. So really we wanted to think of a way to provide a really great experience for, for wayfinding and content surfacing for all people regardless of their ability. And um, initially we weren't actually considering beacons for, for this project. It was a little bit early on in, in um, the life of, of the beacon technology. Um, you know, they were out, but not a lot of vendors were actually selling beacons yet. It was just a protocol that people were starting to prototype. Uh, however, they did settle on a Cisco-based indoor positioning based on, on Wi-Fi, uh, which uh, after quite a bit of uh, experimentation worked, and we were able to build in some functionality to help with Wi-Finding there. So uh, when you uh, move from room to room, you get a notification that says which room that you're in and allow you can quickly then tap on that notification to go and access content that's in that room. But uh, you know, about a year into the project, as beacons started to become more widely available, 
uh, everybody on, on the CMHR side and our side, that'll be a really great idea. Let's see how we can integrate Beacon technology to see if we can get a little bit more granular with surface and content. And one of the main driving factors for that is, uh, is again, accessibility. So uh, throughout the, the museum, CMHR has uh, universal keypads where um, they're uh, accessible keypads that are on the wall or on exhibits that users can then bring up alternative formats for content. So if there's a video on the wall, uh, people that aren't able to, to see the video for any particular reason um, are able to then use the keypad to bring up an alternative format, so uh, you know, audio description or closed captioning. Uh, but we wanted the app to be able to help surface this content as well. So what we did is we built in a kind of, uh, as I was mentioning, near me mode. Uh, so you can enter this mode uh, anywhere in the app, and as you move through, the app will surface content that's nearby you. Not only the, the audio content from uh, that is a uh, from, from the app, but also universal uh, accessibility content. And also just, just, just descriptions also of what's actually in the space, because it is so, the space itself is incredibly interactive. I would 90% of their, of their uh, exhibits are interactive, they're digital, they're not, they don't have actual artifacts in most of the stuff in the museum. So this is a way to sort of get people more engaged and have an idea of what was going on within each space, because it's a little overwhelming at times. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about the uh, Science Museum London uh, for a second. This was a pilot project uh, where the goal was to launch an application for users when they brought their own device, and it was specifically for users with visual impairments. Um, and the idea was it was to be a wayfinding guide to allow them to navigate this, this complicated space and consume all of the content very easily. Uh, and I think going back to your question, uh, sir, about overlapping signals, and we'll you know kind of talk about some of the results here, um, overlapping signals was an issue uh, in this particular space. We wanted uh, signals to be very discreet, to be able to lead users through this uh, massive, massive space. They could go from one to the next very, very easily. And of course, if there were overlapping signals and if the application is bouncing between two things, suddenly it's, it's no longer a useful tool. Uh, you know, people, people do get lost. Um, and I, I will come back to that and kind of how we tried to address that in a second. Um, so the, the application, the idea was, uh, it was for those with low vision or no vision, uh, it was to be a wayfinding tool, and ideally they, um, uh, the museum wanted content to trigger only within about a meter uh, of content. So they wanted people to be very, very close before it changed on screen. Uh, this was to be a tool for on-site only, uh, there would be no way to use it at home. Um, you actually had to be in the space and very, very close to the content. Um, the result, uh, it wasn't very intuitive. Um, this was an example of, uh, you know, we went through, we, we did agile development, we prototyped, um, did all sorts of on-site testing, but in the end it was an application where the feature set defined is not the feature set users wanted. Um, you know, they, they did find it very non-intuitive. Uh, many users uh, during later user testing found it hard to use. Um, we were trying to uh, tackle some gesture-based interaction and uh, one of the pieces of feedback we got from uh, certain users was that they only had one hand available. You know, uh, their other hand might be on a cane or on a guide dog and uh, just based on that they couldn't do three finger gestures, uh, two finger gestures and so on. Um, the beacons just weren't accurate enough. Uh, you know, when we're talking about um, trying to really nail down one meter, signal strength has to be lowered a lot, and of course there are environmental factors, and even branding within the museum. The, the beacon can't just be placed on the outside of a, a glass cabinet, it needs to be discreet on a ceiling, in the floor, behind something, um, and with those uh, impediments or you know glass metal, etc., it, it interfered with signal strength. And then of course there was um, reading different signals and you know kind of flipping between content probably spent a couple of weeks on that just trying to write algorithms that was trying to keep track of the full history of what's detected, not switching based on paths we thought uh, users would take. And I, in all honesty, it worked okay, um, but not, not well enough, uh, not well enough to launch the project. Um, so as we're, you know, we're talking about other apps, we work around it by offering a different experience, you know, content surface and show a lot of content. In this case, uh, with the goal of that one meter accuracy, uh, we just couldn't make it work. Um, this, the, the overlapping signals became an issue. Yeah, and I, just, I just wanted to add, I think there's a, there's a nice tie-in here to the, uh, what we learned about this project to the keynote the other day uh, about human-centered design. Um, at the, the museum and Acoustic Guide both brought our own ideas about how to solve these problems uh, to the app. And uh, you know, we had some good ideas, we put in a lot of hard work, 
but the one thing we actually didn't do was consult with the stakeholders of the, the actual users, the people that were going to be using this app um, beforehand. We, uh, we tested extensively with them, uh, but not until we'd already designed and developed the app. So, uh, you know, I think if we were to work on a project like this again, or even just in general, it's a real great learning experience to make sure that you're, uh, you're talking to and asking people what they want before you start building it. All right, next up is uh, the Guggenheim. So we've been working with the, the Guggenheim for, for a number of years now. Uh, we have a, a mobile app that is available to download uh, on your own device, and they also have, what, 500 um, rental iPods on, 400 rental iPods on site uh, that uses the app. Uh, the app has generally uh, about five audio tours, uh, multimedia tours that users can, can choose from, from the permanent collection and architecture tour, and, uh, and two or three uh, temporary exhibitions. Um, the app has been in, in use for a couple of years now, and uh, in general, people seem to, to quite like it. Whenever we visit the, the, the museum, uh, lots of people are, are using it. It's really neat to see uh, tons and tons of people using something you've, you've built. Um, this past year, we've uh, started working with the Guggenheim to uh, add an update to that uh, with, uh, to make use of Beacon technology to uh, design a different way to surface content. So prior to this, uh, the way that people uh, found content as they moved through the museum was one of two ways. They could take a, a very specific tour, uh, they, could, they could choose uh, any number of the tours that are available on device, um, and then they could browse the tour stops in a list. And then as you go through the museum, you go from stop to stop to stop. Uh, of course, the other way that people, um, and this is a very common behavior, uh, like to access content in, in, in these sorts of apps, um, is sort of a, a, a more, uh, late in the day, guys, it's Friday. <laughs> uh, sort of a, a choose your own adventure type of approach where as you go through, uh, people see things that they want to learn more about and then they find that in the app. And one of the main ways that people do that in the Guggenheim app is with a keypad. Uh, so with Beacon Technology being uh, something that we were all interested in, we started to think about different ways that we could use uh, beacons to surface technology. Um, and again, we sort of circled around back to this near me uh, kind of uh, experience. Uh, which is the screenshot that you see up on the left. So as you uh, move through the, the Guggenheim, uh, stops that are from um, any tour are surfaced uh, on, your, on your screen, um, as well as uh, a representative of, of an exhibition. If there's an exhibition in a room that you happen to go into, we'll surface that. Um, the Guggenheim can choose to surface uh, videos directly on this screen, whereas previously uh, videos were uh, sometimes hidden behind a couple of menus. Uh, so it's a really just a, a new way for, uh, in this app, for the Guggenheim to experiment with different ways to surface content um, more quickly to users and, and allow them to sort of get lost in a way as they go through the museum without being quite as uh, prescriptive about, you know, you're following a tour and you must go from A to B. Great. Um, so before we get to, you can change it, before we get to part two, the Hunger Games, which I'm excited to talk about, it's kind of been one of my pet projects uh, the past few months. Um, but I'd like to throw a curveball over to John. <laughs> um, so it, it, Jeff was just commenting on uh, kind of surfacing content in, in an app. I wonder if you wanted to, if, or if you had any, anything to talk about um, how beacons can change a narrative of, an, a, of a space. And I, I felt that you did that really well with, with Hunger Games. And if you wanted to use that as an example, the segue, that would that'd be great. I'd be stealing my thunder for Hunger Games. But yeah, no, it absolutely does. It, it gives it allows multiple strategies to, in terms of how to tell whatever story is being told within an exhibition. Whether it's, you know, you can try for something that's more linear, you can, I think one of the things we're learning more and more, especially with applications, is you can do a little bit of social engineering with your, with your visitors. You can push them in, in certain directions. You can try and deliver a more linear experience if you only give them a list view. You can uh, encourage them to do more of a choose your own adventure if you give them a more jumbled view. Um, but I think what's interesting and what we found interesting was your ability to tell a story and being able to really sort of form your story differently knowing it's going to be triggered in a different way. And it's going to be almost more spontaneous and, and feel more spontaneous and feel more storytelling as opposed to very object oriented. And that was one of the things that was great about, uh, that I found fun about Hunger Games is there was a lot, we made, I mean obviously, made up a ton of stuff, which was, all, which was also <laughs> fun. I didn't get some stuff with somebody telling me exactly what I had to say. But um, 
I think it opens up a lot of a lot of opportunities for telling stories in different ways and getting people engaged in different ways. A lot of times, more visually and you know, using the device to to, to really it it triggers a different it triggers a different experience. It's a more it can be more tactile. It can be more more auditory. It can be more experiential in general. Well, one phrase I heard a lot during this project. Uh, you can go ahead. One phrase I heard a lot during the project was a heads up versus a heads down experience. So maybe maybe when we get to John's portion of this, you can talk a little bit about that. But I I really like the concept of the the app or the audio mobile experience facilitating what the, the space that you were in rather than vice versa. So I really enjoyed that concept and I try to approach all my projects with that now. Uh, but anyway, the overview of the Hunger Games. So um, the project was run and, and initiated by Lionsgate Entertainment. Uh, we were shortlisted to do a project with them, and the project that we initially started with was not the project we ended up making. And, and part of that was um, through lots of collaboration, lots of discussion, lots of uh, demographics and, and stats they had about their own user base and, and their expected uh, the people to come to the exhibition, but they really had no data outside of projections. So that was that was a challenge for the, for them and for us to decide what to put into the app itself. Um, but what it ended up becoming, and I'll, I'll let John go into more detail about it, uh, since he's the one who created it, um, is really uh, a following Katniss on her journey through Penem. I don't know if you guys are Hunger Games fans, but maybe, yeah, yeah, all right. Uh, following Katniss through her journey through Penem, both uh, physically as she travels through Penem to the different districts and, and to the different areas within the, the nation, uh, but also metaphorically through uh, a, a journey of a girl to becoming um, uh, a, a celebrity to a, a rebel or a symbol of a, of a revolution. Um, and in, in, in that, uh, we we developed some really cool features uh, from Jeff and Simon uh, with passports and different cool things that I think the, I'll let them talk about since they made it, even though I feel like it's mine. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I already talked about how we got involved, so if, if there are any questions, no? Um, so what they wanted or what they thought they wanted? That's a, a good question to bring up. Uh, I touched on it briefly, but we, we had a, a millions of ideas of the things we wanted to make. Um, and once, once we actually started designing the thing, the scope of the project changed constantly. So we really developed a very flexible way of working uh, on this tour. Um, and these are some of the features that exist in it. Do you guys want to take some of this? Yeah, yeah sure. I think uh, we have a whole uh, lot of, of bullet points up on, on the screen yeah. here. And, uh, this, these are just uh, examples of what the client was interested in, in including in this experience. Um, I think we all came to, to the table initially uh, for our first uh, consultations once we were uh, awarded the contract with very little expectations about uh, what the experience was going to be. We really wanted to hear from them, uh, and they had a lot to say. You know, they wanted they wanted quizzes, they wanted AR, they wanted games, they wanted social media, they wanted they essentially wanted Instagram to be part of it. You know, they wanted to be able to maybe do something cool where you could. Uh, tag a, a Mockingjay uh, graffiti uh, somewhere in, in the real world and then take a picture of that. Um, so, you know, I think our, our challenge initially was to take a list, uh, take a look at this, you know, this long list of things that they were hoping to do, uh, pair that back to something uh, sensible uh, and, and mostly sensible, you know, in terms of the, you know, making a time. sane user experience. Well, yeah, you time. <laughs> uh, the, the reality was is that we essentially kicked off the project in what, February or, or March, Michael? March, well, we, March? we started talking about it in February. The, the project kicked off, the, second week in March. Yeah. the creative concept was in March, and then we didn't really get an agreement done until the 25th of March. The project launched July 1st. So it was, uh, it was all, I guess, the four of us really, really just putting a... Uh, it was get, Michael holding, holding it over. Uh, holding a whip, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and timeline, resentment. <laughs> tight timeline has an excellent way of uh, bringing things into focus. You know, it, it, it's an excellent way of answering, can you do this? It also it is actually really good in terms of pulling the client back because they realized they couldn't fulfill the things they need to give us in some cases. But then on the same token, they were really surprised with the product in the end and what we were able to produce. Uh, and then most surprisingly to me was the things that r really stood out to them and to our visitors were not necessarily the things that we thought were going to stand out and sing to the visitors. 
Um, so one, one example of that, I'm, I'm totally going off the slides so I don't care, uh, was, yeah, I'm just going now. Give me a mic and I'll just start to talking. Uh, so there's two experiences really with this app. One is the off-site experience and one is the on-site experience. And that has a lot to do with the beacon. So when you launch the app on-site, the app looks different and it acts different than it does when you're off-site. Uh, it senses that there's a beacons in the area and it launches a, a separate user interface, um, which seemed like it had to be that way for us. And that's not something I think, I always said I thought was going to be the standout mar marquee of the app, but it turns out lots of people comment on that and have had other ideas based off of our work on this and have suggested it to us for other projects, um, which is, is really fantastic. Um, things, what, what else? What else really stood out to you guys? We should give. Uh, I think we should let John Thank do a little uh, overview of what we. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What we, what we ended up did. pitching to them and what we ended up building. All right. Well, I mean, we. I think we can just jump into it. We we started. They started in a completely different place than we ended up. It was it was a behind the scenes exhibition originally. It was like, here's about location scouts. Here's about costumers. Here's. It was that that was their original approach, and we Jeff and I kind of talked about it, and we came back to them with, how about if we keep it all in world. And we're moving through the world of Pan Am however many years after the revolution. This is a museum of Pan Am, a museum about Katniss. You know, if, they, if we're talking about their fans as being their main, their main uh, visitor base, why not take it to like, have, have it be more experiential? That way we can build a much more immersive environment. It would be more fun. It's not, it's not so much pulling back the curtain and seeing that the wizard is this little tiny guy who's not really very impressive after all. You know, right. it, was, it was keeping it more magic. Yeah, so what the, the app supposes is that if you're on site and you see uh, the gown that Effie wore uh, when she was in the Capitol, uh, that's not a prop from the movie. That's something that this person actually wore uh, in, in history, in the history of, of Pan Am. So we, yeah, so that's kind of the, that was our, that was our, like, the basic, the, fun, the foundation of our pitch to them. And from there, what they really wanted was a pre-visit experience, a visit experience, and a post-visit experience, something to keep somebody completely engaged. So the minute you downloaded the app, you were finding out things about the exhibition, finding out things about Katniss, whatever. Then you go to the exhibition and you, you do get, the, our, one of our goals was there's a lot of content that you will never see if you don't go to the exhibition. There's, we have you know, everything from hidden stops to interactives to, you know, to the passport, things that you can't really take full advantage of unless you actually come to the exhibition. And then once you leave the exhibition, there's the piece that follows you home. Um, what else should I, what else? I'd, I'd like to touch a little bit more on what you were just saying, John, about how uh, staying in world was what a decision, but it was really more than I, and I, I thought it was really smart of John <laughs> to be able to come up with that because the one of the the, the antithesis to that was, was mentioned, but the, the goal, they wanted to be able to bring up some of the issues of ancient Rome and why they used the chariots. Um, the the inspiration of, of Joan of Arc uh, as the the heroine of of Hunger Games, and they wanted to address all these things and and show the thought behind the author's motives for including them, but they also wanted to keep it in world, and that's that's what I thought was so smart about the solution of putting it into the future, and making this an exhibition in that world, which included ancient Rome and and France and all those things. Yeah, there's I mean. There's Um, we were just kind of, it was an idea of tor totally reflecting the same ideas that are in the movies and just sort of maintaining that universe. And actually, they, they were, they hadn't, there's a lot of stuff they hadn't done yet when we started, one of which is there's an introductory video. You walk in and um, Effie, whatever, Elizabeth Banks does sort of an intro video to welcome you into the exhibition. And they really changed that to reflect much more what we decided to do with the app, keeping it in world. Originally it was going to be, you're gonna see behind the scenes, you're gonna see, we're gonna pull back the curtain and you're gonna see how everything's made and it turned into much more about, you're gonna live the magic of this movie and the, this, set of, this set of movies, these books, this, this experience. So I think it, it turned out being a really big change. What kind of engagement did you see on the pre, during, and post? Like in, in terms 90 of?
I don't know the download numbers. Yep. I can tell you that people in inside, it makes a huge, like there's people who, I spoke to people both who took it and who didn't, who, you, who went through the exhibition with and without it. And it's a, it's a, it's an enormous gulf between the, ex, the experiences and the people who didn't really saw it and were like, oh, that's kind of amazing. And like, or like their kids took it and they didn't. And they realized there's, it's a big difference. Um, so. Yeah. And I don't, people use it after they left the exhibit. Yeah, I, I don't know that we have um, hard I, data on yeah. that. Uh, Michael might have. If I could just jump in for a second, Please. though. Um, just an anecdotally, um, I can say that, uh, just sort of echo something that, that John just said. Um, uh, before the show, um, I don't know that we've built actually something, uh, an experience that is super compelling if you're not on, on site. There's certainly, you can access the content, you can access some, some of the, uh, the audio and some of the videos and the, you know, the photo feature. You can certainly do that off site. Uh, but it really all comes together on site. Um, on site, uh, walking through the exhibition, um, uptake um, on, uh, we have uh, rental devices there as well, rental iPods running that you can buy with your ticket. Um, the, the uptick for those are, are decent, and the people that uh, are using it, uh, I, I saw them using it a lot. They were using it extensively as they went through the exhibit, which uh, is contrary to sometimes when we've built um, other uh, uh, experiences that are a little bit more audio-based, uh, where you know, people are using it, but sometimes you know, the, the app is just hanging on the lanyard, uh, the device is hanging on the lanyard, and people are walking around and, and, and looking at other things. There was a real, um, I really enjoyed seeing the, re the, the interplay between people using the device and being, getting engaged with the exhibit. And I'll maybe just chime in very, very quickly. If you look at the middle screenshot there, this is uh, what we call the passport. Um, and so y you can think of it as a favorite list, but it's more users can take photos, add uh, filters, tags, etc. Um, this can then be shared, and it is synced to the web at all times, so you can view your passport on the web. Uh, in terms of rental devices, so users that are actually renting the iPods on site, we're seeing uh, at least 3,000 shares a month um, of passports, and then of course just getting emails back saying, you know, oh, thanks for the visit, etc. Um, so we know that, at least in that case, on the rental devices only, 3,000 users a month are, uh, are sharing their photos um, with that feature. Yeah, and I think the, uh, you know, since we're, we're on the screen and the passport is up, uh, I think this was a really uh, something that I really liked about the app uh, on rental devices um, or you know in general when you're talking to, to clients or if you're looking at, at building any kind of experience something that's going to come up is, is social media uh, how can we um, uh, allow our users to share content out and then allow that to to spread maybe uh, use that a way as a way to bring more visitors back to the museum as a way to foster engagement with our with our visitors um, but if you have a, a, a rental uh, device uh, where you're handing out, uh, you know, iPods with uh, with an app on site, um, you don't really, you can't really build in uh, Facebook or, or Twitter in integration. Uh, people just don't want to um, authorize and put in their, their passwords for social media on a public device. Um, and nor do I think should institutions really foster that kind of behavior. There's privacy implications, security. Um, and it's just not a great user experience as well. You know, you want you go to share, and then you brought up a dialogue to, to in, you know, put in your, your user information. So it's a little bit of a broken experience. So what we did instead was uh, the Passport, uh, as Simon said, has a, uh, a web component. And as you're uh, in the app, adding uh, photos that you take with the app, as you're saving your favorite stops to, to your Passport, um, we the app also has uh, uh, stamps. Your Passport gets stamped, which are kind of like uh, achievements. So we. Just a minor gamification uh, of the space that as you move through uh, and, and come in contact with certain beacons or, or open up certain uh, bits of content, you unlock uh, stamps that go on your passport. So people are really creating this personalized thing and as you're creating that, um, that all gets synced and saved to, to the web. Um, so what you can then do is if you're on a personal device, you can immediately share your, the, the web version of your passport out to Facebook or Twitter, whatever service happens to be uh, on your device and that you use. Uh, but if you're on a rental device, what we do is you just enter your user, uh, your email address. We email you a link to, to view that on the web. So when you get home or when you open it up on your personal device, then you have access to this personalized uh, record of your visit to the exhibit that, um, you know, could have some pretty cool pictures that you took or, or uh, you know, it's just kind of a neat thing. Yeah. Can we assume your demographic for this is, you know, you know under, skewed highly under 40? Probably. Yeah, they have well, the ability to sort of go to town. Right? Yeah, it, Lionsgate, like Lionsgate gave us yeah. like what they what they assumed their demo was, which was wrong. Which was wrong. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they skewed older. Like they thought they were just going to skew like 
in their like 20s and 30s. Or like early 26 to 35 yeah. is kind of what they were thinking. But surprisingly, what we saw on site was, uh, of course, a lot of uh, parents going through with their kids. But the kids kind of look at things. They go with the interactives. They do some of the audio content. Uh, but then we see the parents, especially fathers, actually, um, really listening to all the audio content and really trying to dive deeper, which was a surprise to us and Lionsgate and everyone else there, to be, to be frank. Um, so the, the demographic, uh, I think, was appealing you know, on a wider range than we anticipated. But differently. I think, I think it appeals differently. Differently, I don't yeah. Think we, I don't think we could have made it. Like, I think we did aim for a younger audience, and I think maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if we would have changed anything necessarily, but I don't, I don't think it ended up just being that audience. Yeah, so uh, we'll see a couple more features of the app. I'm happy yeah. to talk to more about it afterwards. Uh, I know everyone wants to get out of here, but uh, I'll let these guys talk a little bit more about the features, and I, then afterwards, if you want to talk about which features were more popular with who and, and who was interacting with what, I'm, I'm happy to to stay after as long as you guys want. So, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff, like one of the, their big things was personal engagement. So we tried to, try to uh, personalize the tour to, to some extent. So not everybody would have exactly the same experience. So one of the things we came up with was choosing someone to ally yourself with, which was one of Katniss's best friends or one of her main allies. And we, um, so there were three. I wanted some other ones that there were people who weren't as popular apparently with a lot of people. Um, <laughs> But uh, so it, depending on which ally you select, and you don't have to select an ally, you can't go without. If you, whichever ally you select, you do get an, a couple extra stops that are oriented towards specifically that ally's story and how it, how it interacts. So you would get would be a, another one of those stops that you not, wouldn't see necessarily if you weren't on site. And then this was Chev's. Yeah, so as Michael was saying uh, earlier, um, actually maybe if you wanna just quickly jump ahead one slide, Simon. If you look on the, the left side, so this is the, the stop list for all, all intents and purposes. It's the, uh, the, the multimedia tour and you can access it from a stop. And this mode is available um, from anywhere. So if you are at home, uh, you can access any of these stops, a few of the, the interactives. Um, the uh, ally specific content that John was talking about isn't available via the stop list um, on, unless you're on site. Um, and there's a, we'll get to in a minute, the concept of some uh, hidden stops that weren't available on site. But, by and large, you can access most, you know, 80% of the content if you're off-site. You want to just jump back. Um, when you are on-site, as Michael was saying, the, the app uh, changes completely and it becomes much less of a, of a list mode and, and much more of sort of a, a non-linear uh, free-flooring experience. And as you move around the space, um, as the app detects beacons, we then surface content based on, on where you are in the exhibit. And uh, you know, Michael and, and some people on our team did a, a ton of work uh, installing the, the beacons and tweaking them to make sure that um, A, that there was uh, some, you know, some content on screen at almost all times, and, and also that it wasn't, uh, there wasn't too much content on, on screen and, some, uh, and, and none a little bit later, or that, you know, and also making sure that the, the beacons were, were uh, set up properly so that you know, it really was specific to the area of the exhibit that you were in. And, uh, Lionsgate had really divided the, the exhibit up into about five very, um, excuse me, discrete sections uh, based on sort of the, the progression of, uh, as we were saying earlier, of Katniss's journey through the movies uh, as she uh, starts in her in her hometown of, of District 13 and then ends up in, in the capital at the at the end of the movie. District 12? Oh, sorry. <laughs> they wouldn't like me making that mistake. Um, so you can see here that the, you know, what we do is we, we pop up content in sort of this sort of uh, hexagonal grid and the grid reconfigures um, as you move around. Uh, big items are um, supposed to be um, content that is very close to you and items that are small are a little bit further away and they would grow or shrink in size as you move through, uh, which was you know, something that we actually spent quite a bit of time on putting in some, some smoothing algorithms to make sure that things weren't constantly popping around and you know, things were on screen for long enough that you could tap on them but that it still sort of felt uh, yeah, alive. It still is really dynamic, it's actually kind of visually engaging. Want to talk about a bit uh, about some of the content? Oh yeah, so the content um, basically, like I said, we we I wrote it and we produced it as if it was um, legitimately from Pen M. Uh, we created a few characters that apparently some people on Twitter weren't psyched about because they were like, wait, this isn't part of the canon. We don't know who these people are. 
I created a historian and a few other experts that instead of having interviews like an audio tour would have, I had sort of fake interviews. Um, I think it's canon now. It went it, through it's Suzanne canon. Collins, so. Yeah, it did go, and Suzanne Collins did approve my script, by the way. So, <laughs> so it, it's yeah. now part of, it is part of the legend. Um, so, you know, it's it's not necessarily groundbreaking in terms of the format. It's, you know, there's, there's some audio stops with, um, with images, there's video, um, a lot of stuff from the movies. One of the things that was challenging for us is we were very limited in the resources. We couldn't, obviously couldn't record new stuff with these voices of actors who are these characters. They're very well known, so they're not gonna be doing it. So we, that's one of the reasons I had to invent new characters and sort of insert them into the storyline. Um, but we were able to take, we were able, we had relative um, access to video clips and we were able to, to sort of repurpose things from the movies and we actually got to use some stuff that got cut and never, nobody's ever seen before as sort of bonus stuff that got to be included in the app. So you got to see some stuff that you wouldn't have seen had you just gone to the movies. Um, so yeah, audio, video, and then we kind of went on, and then the interactives that get to include some more stuff in them. Two screens. Two screens. Skipping over augmented reality. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier on in the slides, you know, the Lionsgate wanted a ton of interactive, really cool things. And, you know, we were actually really excited to work on a bunch of cool things, but, you know, time was a, was a huge factor. So what we had to do is step back and, and then come and, and propose uh, some things that were interactive and fun and not just listening to audio, not just watching a video. Uh, so we proposed uh, image sliders. Um, so the image on, on the left is, you know, something where you could sort of kind of graffiti uh, something from the, uh, in this capital symbol, you can put a Mockingjay symbol over top, you can slide it back and forth. Uh, we did hotspot images where there's sort of a, a panoramic image that has t tappable hotspots throughout. When you tap on it, uh, you could get a video, you could get a little audio clip, you could get an image. Uh, and then, you know, one of their, their big asks was for uh, augmented reality. And, and we were actually uh, initially uh, sort of tried to talk them out of that a little bit, just <laughs> given, given the time. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's really hard to nail the user experience for. Um, I don't know if any of you were, were here to see the um, augmented reality talk yesterday. Um, it, it takes a lot of work, um, and it takes uh, it can increase file size with uh, if you have 3D models. Um, so initially we were a little bit hesitant, but they uh, they were really really interested in it, and so we we said okay let's let's just get it done. So we uh, incorporated into that um, augmented reality uh, uh, in in one spot, and that's where you have the the game makers table. And if you've seen the the movies, that's where they have these sort of uh, operators of the the Hunger Games, and they're at, they're inserting like. Uh, monsters and, and weird beasts and other challenges that the, uh, the Hunger Games uh, people that are partaking in them have to avoid. Um, and this table is a, is a rec replica of what you actually see in the movies. Um, and if you hold up the, uh, your, your phone, uh, we actually have the, uh, the cornucopia uh, emerge up from the, from the game makers table. And uh, again, if you haven't seen the, the, the movies, the cornucopia is sort of this uh, central meeting space in, in, inside the world of the, the Hunger Games uh, competition where you can get access to food and, and weapons and, and other resources, but it then obviously it's, it's quite a problematic, uh, everybody's trying to get there. Uh, Simon, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit some of the challenges of the, the AR component? No. Fair. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, okay, just real quick. The funniest thing I found it, with actual user experience is that people didn't uh, really know how to interact with the augmented reality. They, they bring it up and you just kind of stare there like, that's cool. But they didn't realize that they can move around and zoom in and zoom out of the cornucopia by, by moving their self and, and the device. So that was an interesting thing for me to see. I, I, I'm really excited to see how augmented reality is learned as a, as a experience in the future. But that's just a side note. Having worked with Acoustic Guide as a museum client, I'm interested in how you see kind of an experience like this one feeding other projects that you do sort of in more of the space that we live and work in. Sure. Great question, Susan. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll John. on the way out. Um, no, I think, I think it goes to the point, the thing I was saying before, which is, the more, the more ways we can kind of play with triggering content, and it, I don't think Bluetooth all the time is the way, I don't think list all the time is the way, I don't think keypad all the time is the way, but it, it goes to that sort of content surfacing and really being able to encourage, I think one of the things like that I heard yesterday that was really great um, at, at Mia, I took one of the tours, and one of the things that, that the woman who led it was saying is that we don't want everybody to be 
to be engaging with this. It's not the goal to get everybody engaged, but with the ones who do are just psyched on it. They're just delighted. And that that's kind of the goal for, I think, for me, is to make an experience that once someone takes it, they're like, this is exactly what I wanted, and I didn't even know I wanted it necessarily. And I think the more things, the more sort of, for me, it's toys. For them, it's tools to play with and sort of experiment with. Like, we're always looking for partners who will play with those things with us, who will give us the opportunity to try out something new, and maybe it won't work perfectly. Maybe it'll be the science museum, and it'll just, it, we'll find out it's not what, what people wanted. But to have that opportunity and to have somebody be like, let's try out a couple of stuff, let's try out a mini tour, whatever. Like, those, I think there's a lot of different ways that we can sort of, I mean, some of the stuff that Jeff comes up with in terms of ideas and in terms of how the user, user experience is going to be, I, I mean, I, working with these guys like opens up my head in terms of how I can actually tell the story. It changes, it changes the narrative beyond narr linear versus nonlinear. Change just completely changes the game. Yeah, I think you know what my takeaways from this project. What I, what am I going to bring to you know all other projects going going forward? You know, regardless if it's sort of entertainment based or uh, an art museum or a science museum or a history museum. Um, you know, content surfacing, trying to use location as a way to bring relevant content when, when people are nearby to it without trying to always be quite so prescriptive about you know, following a specific path. Uh, personalization, uh, you know, I think the, the underlying concept of the passport that we built, uh, being able to create a, a personalized record of your visit, uh, you know, people love using uh, the camera, people love taking pictures, that's a behavior that I think we uh, should support and I think a lot of museums are starting to support. Um, so you know, definitely I'm gonna start thinking uh, about you know different ways that we can create a, a personalized record of, of your visit to to a museum. So one one question on this side. Um, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> this might be good. Uh, one question on this uh, along those lines is really trying to understand. So with Lion, Lionsgate, I'm guessing was looking to use the app as a, uh, to build buzz to drive more ticket sales to the exhibit. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a companion to the exhibition. You take right. it rough walking. So you spend the money on that app so that you can sell more tickets to the exhibition everywhere that exhibition goes. I think one, probably one, I think uh, probably hope that would be the case. I think I don't think that was their main, their main uh, it, goal it's, was yeah. to have it to have you have you buy it when you're there and walk through the exhibition with it. How much yeah. does it cost to buy it? So the uh, there are different price points depending on, on how you're going to the exhibition, but to the general public, it's seven dollars in addition to the ticket price. Okay. So it's but an upsell. It's an upsell, but the, uh, in, in all honesty, um, Lionsgate doesn't really care about the revenue that's being generated from this. This is that this wasn't their goal of ticket sales. It was really a way to carry on with the storyline of of Pan Am and and Katniss and the whole. Uh, world as they expand the universe moving forward into the future. So to them, it was really a, a, a tool. The whole exhibition is a tool to keep it within the, within the public mind. The other thing I think is interesting, too, about the one of the things that's interesting about the, the way we went with in terms of the concept for the app, what the story is, is that in the galleries, they do have wall text. And the wall text, some of it is very out of, out of world based. It's here's what a location scout is. And they were looking in you know, West Virginia, and that's how they found this space. Yeah, I think ultimately what you know, both Lionsgate and ourselves are looking to do is, is add another layer, another to the, to the experience. Um, it, as Michael and John were both saying, I think you know, if you were to just walk through the exhibit, um, they have some cool uh, physical interactives and screens and stuff that you can actually do. Um, but unless you're a super fan, it might be a little bit dry. So I think that's where they were looking for the for the app and the, the audio tour, the multimedia tour, the interactives that we built into it to add another layer to make the exhibit engaging for, for people of, of different age groups and, and people of different interest levels. So yeah, the, the thing I thought I was the most interesting, you talked about the pre, during, and post visit, because one of the challenges as a, a relatively large science museum, I was the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, is thinking about, okay, so somebody might come to our museum, our most loyal fans might come to the museum two times a year at most. Mm -hmm. And so, do you spend half a million dollars to a million dollars bidding an app that is going to make their visit twice a year better? Yeah. Or do you just call it? And so I'm most interested in how you make an app that has that pre, during, and post experience. So it's an app that's servicing them as a as a digital customer year round, which I think is pers this persistence. Why would they not delete it off their phone two yeah. seconds after? So they walk out of this exhibit, they spend two bucks, they delete that thing off their phone. Great, you've just captured some information on them, but I can understand Lionsgate's got money coming out of their ears and they might not care if they spend a couple million dollars in an app and maybe they make some money, maybe they 
don't, but if you're looking at a museum perspective, yeah. strategically, what am I, why am yeah. I going to do an app that's only going to serve as visitors while they're with me? I, I think that's, that's a great point, and I don't have the, the solution for that. I think, um, yeah. you know, I hear this from, from clients <laughs> all the time. Uh, you know, we want people to engage with this when they're off-site and when they're on-site, but the fact of the matter is I'm not sure that that's possible to build one thing that is equally engaging when people are there and when they're not there. Uh, people that are on site have different goals, different interests than people when they're when they're at home. Um, so you know maybe you're not building you know any uh, a single thing that that uh, appeals to to both types of, of users. Um, but I think there there are some uh, aspects to this app and, and and to Susan's point some things that I you know I'm going to start thinking about more and more in other projects as ways to extend the the brand and the the experience and the voice and the story of the museum or the, or the movie or whatever it is past just being there. Um, so we built into this app um, a camera feature where you can add you can make filters and add a frame and and you know it, it's kind of a cool little thing. You know how much are people using that offsite? I'm not actually sure, but it's actually the type of thing that you could build and 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 could be a standalone experience as as well. Um, you know, I know iOS now has the ability to for apps to have extensions. So, could you build a, a photo? Uh, uh, you know, if your app has a photo manipulating uh, feature, could that become an extension that you could use in, in other apps or or in the the iOS Photos app? Um, the the passport is something that people can then access um, days or or weeks after their visit. So, just trying to think of little ways to extend the the, the presence of the organization past just that narrow app experience. Well, I like that you can trigger a different experience if they're in the building or out. Like just yeah. knowing that means that maybe you do build that out experience that's totally different, and when they open it, they're now being served in a totally different yeah. way with content. Or Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we didn't. We were. I mean, obviously, we're out of time, so everybody can leave if they want to. But uh, we, we had, you know, we one of the things that you guys didn't get to see that's further along is we built. We did build these hidden stops that are sort of interactive, and you had to come across them in the space. And they have a little sort of target, and you find it, and you have to find you know place the thing on the target, and then you get a piece, whether it's you know a piece of the movie that didn't make it into the movie, you know, you know whatever stuff, thing, things that were hidden stops that you would never know if you didn't get there. It tells you that in the in the description of the app that there's there's stuff here that's only in the exhibition, and so you know it's stuff that makes it feel a little bit special when you're on site. And once it's unlocked, it's unlocked. You take it home, you get to keep that, and you do have you end up with you know things that. That was one thought. Yeah. I, I think the answer kind of to your point. I think you have you, you design the app with personas in mind. You know, it's a family group or whatever. I think you need to extend it. It's family group before. It's family group at, and it's family group after. You have to think about what is the experience those different personas want from your place, whether it's through an app or a website, however, the big imperialist setting. I think once you have that. Then you can design the solution around that. But then, it, but it means you've actually got to be able to then link between those, so that if during the, um, I don't know, in your museum, but say for example, if they're really interested in background, which is you know, static electricity, all that really cool stuff, then at the after the fact, you need to use that information to reinforce that connection to the visit, which then gives more brand identity to you, yeah. but also then means they're more likely. my mind the challenge with any of our apps for for site visit plays any museum or anything else is it's not in, it, in and of itself a utility to, it's not a utility app it's not a game so if they're to you do it over and over again there's not a, you know obviously there's incredibly diminishing returns unless there's something else that's sort of linking them whether they want to know about the museum and the, maybe those are people who are already motivated I don't know but yeah I think that that is always the challenge is what do you do to sort of make it live beyond that one use and that's that's the question I think I think it comes to the branding. I think it comes to what are you and what do you offer that 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 I need in my everyday life or I need every week or two or whatever, you know, whatever. And that maybe that's something to think about internally for your museum as a science museum. Like you you have a unique position. Maybe there's something that you need to leverage. That's the thing that you use that that identifies you. What I don't know. What I mean, just off the top of my head, it's you know a thermometer. Or, you know, it's like whatever. It is. It's your thing, like you were saying, like the Van der Graaff machine. If you're really interested in, it's the heart, like a, right? It's not, It's it's something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to be fair, both these guys and our experience when we built it actually, we very rarely have clients who want to pay money for us to research the 
before and the after. We hmm. always think about the experience oh, yeah. while they're at the site. And we'll sit there and we'll go, but don't you want them to go home and share the experience with their friends? Yeah, maybe. But it's so little data on why that's worth it. Like, why is it worth building an app to like do visits? For the good yeah, of it. For you. <laughs> like, if you break down the cost of per visit, like, that's a lot. I mean, that's, well, and then that, but that's the question I though, is like, is, data, it, is it about the cost? <laughs> There is data that if you look at our websites, and you, you take, you have to do, you know, squid your eyes a little bit, but you can see how websites, and they do A-B testing about how people engage with with material. You can see people coming back again and again and again, and that's, that indicates to you that there is a need to come back to that information. If you can take those stats, it kind of makes the case for doing the after and the, and the during as well. But you're right, it's an app in, well, there's no, certain things no. that mobile web is great for, and certain things that yeah. it's not great for. And multi multimedia and interactive, yeah. Worth it. Like, like, when you well, it depends on your space, right? But, like, but that, and that's kind of what we're saying. I'm, I'm wayfinding in and of itself. I don't know if it's worth it, but content surfacing and getting people to see things that they might not otherwise see. Yeah, could I, you, could, I think that's that's worth it for yeah, me. Yeah, could you use wayfinding to help with accessibility, like like CMHR has has attempted to to do? Um, and certainly, you know, one strategy that a lot of museums take to increase uptake of, of the app is rental devices on, on site. You know, that's certainly an added cost. You know, there's staffing, there's, there's hardware. Um, but, you know, for instance, at the, the Guggenheim, there's great uptake of, of their rental devices. So you see a lot of people using that app. So that, you know, makes their investment in the app that much more worthwhile because, you know, you can, you know they can almost guarantee that you know, a very high percentage of people coming through the door are going to use that and then use that to improve the experience of being there. I think we're out of time. Um, we were out of time. We've been out of time for about 20 minutes. But if, uh, if anyone wants to stay and talk more, we're all here. If you want to go get drinks, have fun. I'll be there in a minute. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.